it's um, beyond a thrill to be speaking here at the Broad. Um, it's certainly been this mythical place on the other side of the world I've certainly heard plenty about. Um, yes, I, I create animations, and it's actually quite appropriate. You're probably all very, feeling very tired, um, wanting to have a little rest, and you're probably a little bit hungry, too. Um, that's actually one of my key audiences that I try and reach. <laughs> it's my job to grab people like that. They've come home from work, and the kids are yelling, and dinner is trying to be prepared. The news comes on, and it's my job to explain something like breast cancer in 15 seconds or 10 seconds on a national news bulletin. Um, that was initially the target audience of my kind of work and my kind of approach. Um, there turns out to be, and I think I really want to say this to all of the community, there is a vast, vastly bigger market, market out there for this kind of material. There's a huge demand for it in so many different types of audiences. And uh, don't underestimate the, the demand and the need for this kind of work to explain all of science to the general public and to school kids and to university uh, students and so on. Um, I'm, a few of you, I think, uh, more than a few, have seen my shtick before. Um, so I'm sorry, you'll, you'll be seeing it again. But um, hopefully, I've mixed up a little bit. And also, I will be including some new works that are currently in progress that uh, hopefully you'll find interesting. Um, and we'll see how we go through that stuff. Um, so the, the, three, the four areas I'm going to go through, two minutes on the tradition of um, scientific visualization, because you know, in two minutes, you can cover it. Um, <laughs> I'll be doing malaria, the malaria life cycle, which is one of my own personal projects that I spent about 12 months to doing. And um, it is complicated biology, but um, uh, yeah. Actually, I should say up front, my, the, perp, the, the sort of the, the, the idea behind my work and what I've discovered, I'm, I'm adamant this is the way to go, is that when you create a visualization, you, for, particularly for the public, you never, ever dumb it down. You don't simplify it. You show them exactly what the science is about. But what you must never do, or try and steer away from, is use complex, complex verbal language, the technical jargon of science. That's what is what makes this stuff opaque to them. That's what, they, that's what they don't get, no one wants to listen to. But if you show them the science, they'll get it. But it's just, the trick is, how do you explain it to them verbally? You know, that, that, that's really the barrier. I'm going to play a little bit of DNA work, some of my old work from about eight years ago, but also some of the current works in progress on DNA. And then also some, if we have time, I'll go into uh, some brain simulations. Now, each of these, uh, the malaria, DNA, and brain, are different scales. That's kind of why I chose them. Um, but there's plenty of other materials. And I'll show you a website at the end where if you want to see other bits and pieces, not only my own work, but all the amazing work in uh, biomedical visualization that's going on at the moment. So OK. So what I'm doing, and uh, this whole field, is nothing new. Uh, scientists have always created pictures as part of their thinking process, as part of their discovery process, and also to convey what they're discovering to other people, to the public. Um, and I've chosen two well-known examples because they both use technology to look beyond our normal human vision, and then used art to present what they saw. So Galileo, using a telescope, created these watercolors of the moon, and this was a revolution. Uh, this is a complete revelation for, for humans to realize that the moon wasn't this perfect heavenly sphere, but it's in fact a rack, rocky, craggy world, a world out there. Um, and uh, Ernst Haeckel, who used a microscope to do these exquisite um, uh, illustrations of the microscopic creatures around us. And for me, this is uh, the labs I, uh, lab I came from in my research years. Uh, we studied the, the big uh, round guy in the middle up the top there. This is Microsterius. This is a single-celled creature. Um, and a little bit in self-indulgent, but it does lead into uh, the malaria story. Um, this is footage from the lab I worked in. And that actually, that was Microsterius, the species I studied. Most life on Earth, almost 99% you know, of life on Earth is all microscopic creatures. We're the exceptions, us big stuff. If you look in the river here and just take a little sample of water, or if you look at the damp soil, uh, a bit of green pond scum around you as you walk down in the, in the gutter there, if you look out under the microscope, it's exquisitely beautiful. And that's what most of life is all about. Um, this is it's a, a dinoflagellate. So when you hear about red tides and, and toxic algal blooms, that was that stuff. This is a sample of soil. Um, so all of these creatures, except that actually that big guy in the middle, these are all single cell creatures. This is an, a euglena. Um, that red dot up the front there is actually an eye spot. So it's an alga, so it uses photosynthesis, but it also has an eye. It can tell where the direction of light is, and it can steer itself away or towards it. 
it's exquisitely beautiful. There's another species. I just had to put it in there because look at that. I mean, there's nothing we can make up as humans that uh, nature's way ahead of us. Um, Sinura. This is one of the top three most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. Unfortunately, you're seeing it through analog video recording of it, but this stuff is liquid gold under the microscope. It's exquisitely beautiful. And if you ever, if you know a microscopist can take a sample of this stuff, I highly recommend it. It is, it is thrilling to see this stuff under the microscope. A four-celled cr creature, so we're heading into multicellularity here. Um, again, this is really common stuff. It's everywhere around us. We're just not aware of it because it's a smaller scale than we're, we're used to. So this is a colonial, uh, a multi-celled species, triangular species of creatures. I mean, how do you make this stuff up? <laughs> um, one more and I'll move on, but it just goes on and on and on. I'd, I'd love to just sit here for the next 40 minutes and talk about these guys. This is a diatom, so it grows glass around itself. So each one of those lines is one cell. They get together and they use this form of motility, this in real time, to get around. So like sliding rails, they slide against each other and scoot around. I mean, biology, man. Um, <laughs> That's how big this stuff, these are giants, these are volvox, very common, um, four-celled species, and so on. Anyway, those are all proteins. Um, we're going to talk about another type of protease, um, which is one that actually uses our, us as its world. That's where it lives. It, it's malaria, and it not only affects us, but it's also adapted to jump to another species, a mosquito, and also infect that. And so we have many sophisticated systems inside our bodies to fight infections. And malaria, which has been with us, as you'll hear, for a long time, um, has developed all sorts of techniques to, to thwart all of our defenses, our immune system, and to hide from our immune system, but also to use our immune system to infect us and cause disease. So this is the best diagram I know of, of the malaria life cycle. And it just shows you how complicated this thing is. Um, the main stage you'll hear about is this stage, where malaria infects red blood cells and then bursts out and then infects red blood, red blood cells. But there's a whole stage. So here's a mosquito biting a human that's going in the skin, travels in the bloodstream, heads into the liver, and then has an infection stage. It delays for about seven days and bursts out and then starts infecting the blood. So this top half is all about the mosquito side. I'm going to play uh, an animation. What, the, I did this in 2008, and what I wanted to do was do a comprehensive collection of animations that cover this entire life cycle. I'm looking at this and it's complicated. It is complicated, I can't avoid it. But I wanted to see what all of this life cycle would actually look like if we could see it. And there was a lot of really good data. Um, and I'll show you the sorts of data that I use. Um, so I'm, I'm more of a, a naturalist biologist. I, I, I go from observation. Where it's available, I'll take real data, like the protein models that we were talking about earlier today, and incorporate them directly in the animations and also other forms of simulation. But um, for the most part, I use observation. So this is a scanning electron micrograph of uh, Anopheles uh, a mosquito head. And um, the sorts of things I'm looking at is the, the detail, these sort of feathery things on, on the outside of um, the proboscis. It's sort of a sheath that goes around it. Um, stylets, these are um, they're usually straight. These are the blades they use to chop up our skin. Um, Another one, which is a, a beautiful summary of how when the mosquito bites, what I found interesting is, well, the sheath, that, hair, that feathery sheath bends backwards, but the, the, the proboscis doesn't go straight down. It actually bends around. It's very flexible. Um, and this is actually incorrect. It doesn't enter into a blood vessel. Gruesomely, what the mosquito does is chop up our blood vessels and then lap up or suck up the blood that, that's spilling out of there. I expected it to be a, a piercing into the blood vessel, but that turns out to not be the case. Um, oh, okay, so here's that, that uh, the red is the proboscis, this is the mouse's ear that is fluorescently labeled. Um, this is the, the mosquito's proboscis stabbing in, and this is the malaria parasite, that first stage, that's thin and long specifically to fit down the proboscis, so which is a, quite a tiny, tiny thing. It then, also you might see there's sort of a gliding movement. All of my animations, everything, as much as I can do it, is to scale. The movements are all derived from real life microscopy, and in fact, there's a couple of moments that look fake, uh, particularly the gliding of the malaria parasite. You'll see it glide around and then glide through a blood vessel and glide through tissue. And you sort of expect it to be, oh, to interact with membranes and so on. No, it just plunges straight through. In fact, it uses, it goes backwards and forwards and will destroy cells on its way. That's part of its process. That's what it uses. Okay, and I'll, I'll quickly, this is a scanning electron micrograph of um, blood vessels just under, so this is, um, under a, uh, uh, the fingerprint, so uh, under, just under the skin, so the, um, you can sort of see these ridges. Those are the lines of, 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 of the, uh, a person's finger, fingerprint. And um, this sort of information gets fed into the animations. I try and reconstruct it. Sorry about the surgery just before dinner, but um, 
this is a beautiful footage, um, and in fact, was quite useful in multiple ways. Filmed in Japan, what I, all right, you have the textures. This is the liver, because it's an part, important part of, uh, of malaria. But what I found interesting is also the way the heart just through here, through the diaphragm, is sort of thumping onto the liver. I found that sort of dynamics quite interesting. Um, also, this is looking inside a liver, a transection. This is a hepatocyte, a liver cell, and looking at the blood flow, um, that was very influential for how I was going to create it, but everything working out things to scale. These little things here are actually beads that they put into the bloodstream, and they've attached to a cell that's sitting inside the bloodstream, which is actually part of your immune system. It's called a, a dirt cell because it eats all the dirt in your bloodstream, and mainly it's, it's there to absorb all the parasites and so on. It's called a Kupfer cell, and actually that's one thing. For all my animations, when I add narration, I try and never use any technical language whatsoever. I have to find a different way to explain it. This is one I couldn't avoid. The, use, the only word I couldn't get rid of was Kupfer, because it is a specific cell we're, we're talking about. So that's the only word that made it into the, to the narration you're about to hear. But the Kupfer cell is specifically there to sense parasites in the bloodstream and eat them. So what does malaria use? But it uses it as a front door to get into your liver. I mean, it's a devious, evil creature. All right. and. This is a specifically uh, oops, um, footage um, from the institute where I work. They're, they're very focused. This is, these are red blood cells, each of these round discs here. And these little guys here are par the, the malaria parasite at the blood, blood stage. And if you watch this one here, you'll see it attach onto the red blood. So they're very focused. Uh, the research is focused on how it actually enters into the red, red blood cell and if we can stop that somehow. Um, that, that'd be ideal. We can then you know, prevent or cure uh, malaria um, or find a treatment for it or prevention preferably. Um, so it enters and it very vigorously enters. It reorients itself and enters into the red blood cell. So those sorts of dynamics are all incorporated in the animation. OK, um, actually, if it's possible to have the lights down, I'm not sure. Um, this, is, this shot here, it's an opening shot. The, mala uh, mos the malaria mosquito, Anopheles, actually bites at dusk and dawn. It's when it likes to feed on humans. This is supposed to represent the neck of a sleeping child. It could be um, uh, um, anyone. I, I meant to make it ne racially neutral. So it could, because this, this, these animations, these specific animations, are not supposed to be used as you're about to see it. They're a resource for um, uh, doctors without borders. They go and you open up their laptops in a local village and explain what malaria is. Uh, the WHO wants to use it in their own types of stories uh, or documentaries and so on. So um, this is just a collection of the animations that they can then choose from. It's kind of the idea. But I did add narration because um, uh, I wanted to have it as a package that go on YouTube or whatever it may be. The malaria parasite is an ancient organism. It has been with us since before we were human. Famous victims include Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, and George Washington. The malaria life cycle follows a devious path, swapping back and forth between mosquitoes and humans. This mosquito is infected with the malaria parasite. Because she is pregnant, she has become hungry for human blood. During the bite, she injects saliva to stop the blood from clotting. Her infected saliva also carries the malaria parasite. The parasite rides the bloodstream like a network of roads, seeking its first target. The core of your body's blood filter system, the liver. Sensing its arrival at the liver, the parasite searches for an exit. A sentinel Kupfer cell is the entry point to liver tissue. Leaving the blood, the parasite infects a liver cell, killing one or more other cells on its way.